we start it, but I want to just welcome you and say good morning. This is the uh, first, the full day of the IPAT 2012 forum. Uh, great kickoff uh, discussions yesterday afternoon. We had Ralph De La Vega as our keynote, uh, President Peterson, and I think some very good intros that sets the stage for today. We had, um, if some of you were able to participate in the demonstrations last night, uh, you saw some, I think, very effective use of technology and the whole concept here of how technology and the convergence of this is going to impact people's lives. And what we're trying to do here is have Georgia Tech be uh, one of those uh, impactful uh, facilities and universities for how people are going to uh, live, work, and play in the future. So I'm Jeff Evans. I'm the deputy director here for IPAT. Uh, and but what I wanted to kick it off with you. Uh, you're going to have a great discussion today with several pa panels. They're going to be very effective. Uh, you see that in some of your information. Uh, I believe there will be a number of uh, various keynotes and sidebars as well. And then there's going to be some follow-up with some uh, extremely interesting, fascinating demonstrations of uh, student work and applications across the street that will be conducted in part over lunchtime. But uh, just want to welcome you. Uh, I think we'll have a lot of great sidebars and discussions. But more importantly, I wanted to introduce um, uh, I've got the privilege, actually, of introducing uh, the person who fostered this concept that you're going to hear about today with the IRCs, with the Institute for People and Technology being the first one out of the gate. Um, and so he is our executive vice president here at Georgia Tech for research. Uh, he's also our chief morale officer and many other uh, aspects of his, uh, what he does here for Georgia Tech and for IPAT. I want to introduce Dr. Steve Cross. After the news of the past couple, since last Friday, I think maybe we need a chief morals officer, but that's another story. Jeff, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm going to, I want to take a minute to um, embarrass Jeff. <laughs> um, one of, Jeff, one of the things I, I wanted to say publicly is I really appreciate your leadership. Um, leaders are willing to take risk, and <laughs> several years ago when we started thinking about um, what this future media initiative at Georgia Tech would be and forming this Institute for People and Technology, you are willing to take a risk. You're willing uh, to help lead GTRI in a way that Georgia Tech could have more impact, in a way that would also bring benefit back to GTRI. So you agreed to take this deputy director role for Institute for People and Technology, and, and you and Beth have formed a great leadership team. and. Um, and Georgia Tech is very appreciative. So I just wanted to express my appreciation for everything uh, you've done and you're continuing to do. And still, one of the things that just is amazing to me is you still uh, are research active and doing a lot in the wireless space that are creating opportunities from across Georgia Tech in health and uh, defense security, uh, national security applications, and education applications, and many things else. So I, on behalf of Georgia Tech, I thank you very much for, for what you've done. and we're really blessed that you're providing such leadership. And what do leaders do? They're willing to um, look at change and uh, take risk and try to make bigger, better things happen for the organization that they're part of. So thank you very much. Um, and I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> so um, when I started in this position a couple years ago, we, we, we had a community at Georgia Tech that wanted to that knew that the sum was greater than the parts and we could have more impact. And this was very palpable when we put together our strategic plan. Um, faculty and students and staff were yearning for an opportunity where we could, um, we could really make a difference uh, in the world. We could help transform um, health care. We could help transform education. We could help transform the future of uh, manufacturing. And as most universities, um, research universities, great research universities. We were trying to do this on the, at the individual PI, individual faculty level. And the truth is that's where we still need um, to be innovative and need to lead. We need to be a, a community at Georgia Tech that, um, that the individual faculty um, can have the freedom to uh, explore um, really big ideas and, and to lead change. But we also knew that with the um, the way the resources were going um, and, um, 
and for Georgia Tech to have more impact, that we had to have a, a slightly different approach that would still preserve the individual faculty freedoms, but would also provide um, some better uh, marketing, and I guess that's why I'm the chief marketing or chief um, uh, morale officer, uh, to the outside so we could have more impact. And one of the things we did is we, uh, as we produced this new uh, strategic plan and we began to look at um, research, we realized, and, and faculty from across the institute, from the colleges and from GTRI and uh, the Enterprise Innovation Institute were all part of this, that we could group all of our research, about 300 different lab centers, institutes, and groups, into 12 core research areas. That, to outside of Georgia Tech, made sense in terms of mapping to strategic markets. For instance, the state of Georgia was trying to uh, cultivate and bring more industry into. And we could, we could uh, begin to communicate more effectively within these core research areas. Um, one of these is in the area of people and technology, where uh, across Georgia Tech, uh, we have about 20 different faculty-led groups who do great work in the future of digital media, in networking, um, in everything that's required to have uh, information available to um, look at a fundamental change in a healthcare system or um, in an education system or uh, in the entertainment industry. And one of the things we want to do as part of this is we also want to get access to um, infrastructure uh, test beds where we could do things at much larger scale than we could ever do before and we could re un and not really expect to do uh, in, a, in a single uh, faculty member's research group. For instance, boldly we're talking now in partnership with Children's Healthcare and, um, of Atlanta and others about the state of Georgia as our test bed for uh, a new business model for Medicaid and uh, having interoperable electronic patient records across the state and what we might be able to do in terms of uh, looking for trends in the patient data to have uh, more cost effective and um, more timely treatment options for, for kids. And that's, that's exciting. By coming together, we can do this. So the pop popular term, once we created uh, the Institute for People and Technology, um, and doing this in other core research areas where we either had existing interdisciplinary research institutes like the Institute for Paper and Science Technology, the Institute for Manufacturing, or I see the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute, um, the Institute for Bioengineering Bioscience, was to um, be part of what we're trying to do in this region, and that's creating a, a, the popular phrase today is innovation ecosystem. We're trying to provide uh, thought leadership and uh, partnering opportunities uh, so that in our region with other universities, technical colleges, uh, industry, um, um, organizations like the Metro Chamber of Commerce, um, healthcare organizations like Children's Healthcare of of Atlanta and our, our long-standing partnership with Emory, um, we, we can work together to accomplish much more than we can accomplish individually. And that's um, a very exciting thing that we're uh, doing here um, at Georgia Tech now, is trying to be a much better partner. Matter of fact, our research strategy is threefold. We want to um, enable our faculty and our students to pursue transformative research problems, things that are real game changers. Um, that uh, nobody else either is willing to take the risk or has the ideas to do. We know we can't do that by ourselves, so uh, strengthening our collaborative partnerships with other in this region and in this country and, and in this world is a very important thing to do as well. And we want to do this in a way that it has um, fundamental and palpable uh, impact in terms of economic development but also societal impact. And so that's what we're trying to do in these uh, core research areas and these institutes we've created. Now, another great leader, I'm going to turn it over to, to Beth here in just a second. Beth might not. She also was willing to take risk. I mean, you're a well-known well professor in the College of Computing, uh, director of GVU, which I learned stands for GVU. Um, and <laughs> I won't say that it once stood for graphics visualization and usability, but great work that's done in that um, in very important center. Um, and Beth was also willing to take risk for Georgia Tech to be able to do something um, bigger than maybe it thought it could do a couple years ago. So it's almost, we're almost to the two-year anniversary of iPad. I think it's in February. I forget the exact day, but I'm sure we'll celebrate it with leftovers from last night because uh, we're also very frugal here at Georgia Tech. <laughs> I'm saying that because I hope that there is some wine left over. I'm not sure about the sliders. I think I ate most of the sliders last night. But um, 
but it's been a it's been a really challenging two years as we've gotten this in place. But in the past six months or so, it began to feel like this whole strategy um, may actually work, and it's because of great leadership we have um, with the faculty who have um, who have taken the risk uh, to help make change happen uh, within Georgia Tech. So most of you know Beth. Um, her scholarship is superb. She still is very research active, and I'm very um, envious of that. She serves on the advisory board for Microsoft Research, and I don't know how many keynotes you've given uh, so far this year. I know there was one in San Diego not too long ago uh, in, um, in healthcare delivery. And um, so it's my great pleasure to turn the dais over to, to Beth Minot, the executive director of the Institute for People and Technology. Thank you, Steve. And now I'm looking for Ed who is manning the laptop. No? OK. I will do this myself. I know I can. Let's get over to this and get started. All right. Hopefully I don't have to see these stairs again. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thrilled to see everyone uh, back here. Uh, Yes, I think we did have a few too many sliders, uh, but the food was delicious, the demonstrations were amazing, and the conversations were terrific. And it's a real pleasure and opportunity to get some time with you this morning uh, as we warm up and we uh, start to engage a number of interesting conversations around the future of people and technology. Uh, today I want to talk to you um, about the convergence of people, technology, and enterprises. Hopefully by now the people and technology part seems quite familiar and, and uh, doesn't need too much explaining. And we'll get to the enterprises by the end of this conversation. But today I want to start with focusing on the term convergence. And convergence can mean many things and it's, it's an off used and perhaps overused term in our industry. But convergence is really at the heart of what Ralph De La Vega was talking to us about last night where we've started to move from an area where we were overwhelmed by technology, where there were a lot of technology possibilities, and perhaps they were a bit too scattered and a bit too unusable at a particular point in time, but they're starting to weave a fabric of our everyday life. They're starting to create the basis for how we live, work, and play, and it is this convergence. It's understanding this convergence. It's anticipating it and uh, being able to design within the space that are the challenges that we face today as a community. So using convergence as a starting point, I want to talk through four themes around this and continue to build and, and tell the story about the Institute for People Technology, what we're doing at Georgia Tech, and what we hope to do with all of you as our partners. So I think the, the easiest place and the best place to start is looking at the notion of connectivity, and that really uh, connects us. Uh, with uh, De La Vega's comments last night of looking at connected life, connected home, the connected car, the connected environment. Um, but that is, in some sense, where we are now. Let's, let's anticipate where connectivity is going to take us. And one of the terms that has surfaced in the past year, and I was at the World Economic Forum in, in China last year, when we started talking about hyperconnectivity. And hyperconnectivity means that we have these overlaying networks of that we're connected in terms of social media, we're connected in terms of data, we're connected in terms of how frequently we travel. And hyperconnectivity means everything from the speed of information to also the speed of disease, how quickly a virus can and be transmitted around the world, um, and how quickly we need to be able to respond to the changes in our life. And so I want to look at this notion of connectivity, but I want to do it through the lens of media, through the lens of information technologies and where they are taking this. And in particular, I want to talk through what is, an, is the, the uh, preview of our media outlook. Uh, this is an annual report that we publish each year, known as the Future Media Outlook, and it looks at the major disruptive trends within media, um, what we are seeing in terms of uh, in investigations by researchers, what we're seeing in terms of early product offerings by companies, where are people lead, you know, working on that edges of what the media world is going to look like. And so, um, and in many ways, it's going to preview some many of the conversations we're going to have in our panel sessions today. The way we build out this outlook is we, are, we have roundtables throughout the year where we bring in our industry partner guests, we bring in researchers, and we have them discuss with each other, you know, what are the edges, what are the challenges that we're facing. So the first of the six themes that I'm going to talk to you about today is data, living data. Um, and you're going to see this in our social media meets big data uh, panel uh, this, this morning 
which is the questions of how data is infusing all of our interactions, how data is um, becoming the basis for whether it's a scandal in Washington or how data becomes the basis for how you fine tune and understand the electorate um, in terms of understanding uh, voter turnout and uh, electioneering. How data is becoming the basis for how corporations can both spy on each other and how corporations can work with each other. And what we're starting to create is a new fabric for the ways that people connect. And we see this also through the lens of collaboration. Um, it's not a surprise to many of us uh, that uh, companies are now highly distributed across the globe, that we work in a 24-7 uh, work environment. But even within this, we're starting to see new forms of collaboration enabled by connectivity and by data. Uh, two themes of this I'd like to point out. Uh, first is this notion of giganomics. How many people have heard this term? All right, so this is the, the economics of people whose livelihood is one gig to another. Um, now this, uh, and, you know, we've always have had consultants, but what we're starting to see with changes in the workplace, but also changes in terms of how technology allows us to bring together, is that you can have an entire career that is essentially going from gig to gig to gig, um, and you're able to do that because you're connected to uh, your field, you're connected to your community of expertise through networks, through knowledge networks that did not exist before. One of the things that you should anticipate is that crowdsourcing will become much less like mechanical Turk, much less like piecework. That, that, may, that will always exist, but crowdsourcing is going to become much more of, well, I've got a major event to produce. Okay, here are the 20 jobs that need to take place. I need you know, someone who handles events superbly well, someone who handles graphical design superbly well, someone who can run the social media campaign, someone who can do this. And you're just going to put those jobs out there into the crowd, and people are going to bid and compete against that. So it is crowdsourcing, but at a much higher caliber of expertise, much higher caliber of collaboration. So we're going to see crowdsourcing essentially move up the pipeline in terms of how people interact with each other. The other trend that we're starting to see in collaboration is actually the dyad collaboration. So people who've heard of the applications Pear, Avocado, uh, these are social media apps right now for couples. Um, where this exists right now is if, if anyone has sent a uh, text message to their spouse, like, you know, uh, you know I'll be home soon, sweetie, um, and you realize you accidentally sent that to your colleague or your boss, um, so it's, it started from the sense of sometimes you want communication channels dedicated to one particular individual. So we now have some apps around that. Well, that's meeting a certain set of needs, and uh, those are particularly popular. But we're going to start to see the breaking apart of social media, breaking apart of the monolithic Facebook approach into different forms of social networks, different forms of ways that people want to connect to each other, very much like the toggle application that uh, Ralph was talking to us about last night, being able to flip in and out of these different worlds and different lives. These are different forms of collabor collaboration, different ways that people are coming together. And then what we're going to experience within that is a tremendous fluidity of how people are accessing and working across different media modalities. Um, now, this isn't a stranger to anyone who works in the entertainment business. Um, if you're interested in Lost or you're interested in uh, the entire Star Wars uh, world, which is now going to apparently add six more movies and an entire uh, a new cast of characters, you don't really care whether you're worried about broadband or movies or games or Legos. You work within that content ecosystem. And people are starting to expect to be able to dive in and out of content that they care about across different forms of media, different platforms, and different portals. So this fluidity of media has been anticipated in the gaming and entertainment space, but we're now going to start to see this fluidity of media in other arenas. And education, surprisingly to many people, seems to now be one of those disruptive forces. So what does it mean when, uh, instead of education being, OK, here's the class I'm taking, here's the professor, here's the textbook, here are the notes, um, here are the old tests I got from my uh, sorority sisters. Um, you know, that, that used to be the portfolio of how you would tackle uh, a particular, you know, intro, intro to calculus, right? So now, instead, you're going into the Khan Academy, you're looking at online videos, you're looking at courses taught at other universities, uh, you have online uh, study groups forming with open study. Suddenly, there is this plethora of information available to you that you can now consume or con construct in your own way. Some of that may be officially supported by the university or by your classroom. Some of that may just be the, the most easiest and beneficial way to get to the content you care about. And of course, let's not even talk about the 
uh, inappropriate uses of all those material um, in terms of all of the sites that advertise, you know, need a, need a college essay, you know, 25 bucks. Um, by the way, uh, we can tell uh, when people produce this. So what we're seeing is a convergence around how people are sampling media and constructing media, how that is converging around them as individuals and around social cohorts and around organizations. And what this fluidity, what this uh, landscape provides to you is now a space where it also becomes extremely personalized. So one of the roundtables that we led uh, just a few months ago was around personalized health care. So now when there's a set of data, a set of information, a set of colleagues, a set of uh, uh, caregivers, a set of clinicians, all of this is available to you. How do you then construct that into a personal care plan? How do you take the data? How do you understand what are happening with patients like you? Um, everybody's heard of the website by now, the portal patients like me, where people are able to come together and say, you, know, you have this particular uh, disease or these particular symptoms that I have. How do I compare it or how do I understand uh, what's happening to me uh, in the context of what I understand is happening to other individuals? And you now see individuals demanding, going back to their physician, says, well, this is what you've got me prescribed doing, but there's all these other folks who have essentially the same thing as best I understand it. You know, maybe we need to talk. And sometimes the physicians are right, but sometimes the patients are actually pushing the boundaries where they need to. So how do we, under, how do we understand the tools and technologies that will enable people to do this easily? Right now, it's pretty hard to make the world of all of this media and information work just for you. So this is an amazing disruptive opportunity as people begin to provide those tools, provide the landscape for where you can personalize this information um, buffet, uh, the set of expertise and make that work in your space. And then finally, um, we're not only going to talk about information really in the abstract, information is a uh, uh, read on a web page, but we're starting to talk about this world of information, this world of media, uh, this world of connecting to other people, infusing your experience of the physical world. Um, and actually the panel just following this, my conversation with you this morning, is going to look at what is beyond mobile, what is beyond the power of just the smartphone, what is beyond the power of connectivity, and uh, we're going to start treading in the areas that are pretty close to science fiction. We're starting to look at things that are, um, you know, the, whether it's the old Terminator movies or even Matrix, which I guess is an old movie by now. Um, but we're starting to look at these questions of where your perception of the physical world is now starting to change by how information is infused with that environment. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room has seen uh, the, uh, the work around Google Glass. Um, that is a uh, heads-up display, very exciting. Uh, Thad Starner, who's the technical lead on Google Glass, will be showing uh, the panel um, I'll be uh, shepherding the panel this morning's discussion. That is just the very beginning of how do we take this set of information, how do we take this convergence of media, of people, of information, of ways that you want to connect and the things that you want to do, and how that infuse your physical environment and your social environment. Tremendous opportunities, tremendous uh, areas of convergence, but we still have a long way to go to understand how we're going to get there. So lest I make it sound like um, all of this is going to happen at once. You know, we're talking about a number of themes that are going to play out over many years, but these are the types of things that you should anticipate, and they, they don't exist as monolithic themes. They, they, they interplay and they connect with each other and they inform and feed on each other. Uh, so again, this is our report that we're going to be producing. We'll all be releasing it at the end of the year um, and look forward to your comment and our continued discussions around these particular themes. The second area I want to talk about is this, uh, the notion of what it means to design for experiences because I think it's easy to fall into the trap that when I'm talking about the disruptive power of connectivity and the, the potential of uh, augmented reality technologies and mobile and wireless, it's easy to imagine that technology innovation solves this on its own. Um, that it's just the sheer act, the sheer brute force of creating a new piece of technology that then changes our world. But in reality, the people who do this every day know that what we're actually doing is designing experiences. We're designing this relationship between how people and technology interact. And um, as some of you know, I've described this before, is uh, you're actually designing a dance. You're designing how people and technology move with each other. And the end result, the design, the experience, is actually what that dance looks like. 
So I want to showcase for you some of the ways that we are working on designing experiences, designing dances, and what Convergent looks like through that lens. And I want to start by uh, talking about our relationship with Steelcase. Uh, we've been working with Steelcase for uh, about seven years now, and we started working with them on the future of work and the future of the work environment. And the initial question brought to us was, uh, as a, uh, a vendor of you know, high-end office environments, um, they were asking us, what does it mean as technology becomes more and more infused in those environments where you know, it's the workstations and now it's the laptops and it's the handhelds and it's the displays and all of these things are, are essentially in many ways cluttering this environment. Technology is, again, that sense of it being overwhelming. There's a lot of it available to us, but how do we actually integrate it into what we do and how we live and how we work? Uh, so this is actually an example of a, uh, our first design project where we worked together. This was a, a, a table that we designed together where it recognized people's laptops and it did all sorts of things that are still not commercially uh, viable yet. But it started to understand how you would infuse the interaction with the technology with the interaction of the people across the table as opposed to the technology being in the way. And we were thrilled that over the years, and, you know, a number of these discussions, plus all the other work that was happening in Steelcase, you know, produced a set of products now called Mediascape, uh, which I think is one of the most, it's, it's won tremendous awards, uh, and one of the compelling products out there that show uh, that technology is not just something that is kind of added on or becomes a force to be dealt with in the work environment, but it becomes part and parcel of how people interact and how people engage each other in these spaces. And so this question of how do you design the experience, how do you design everything that surrounds human interaction and the things that we want to accomplish, and how does that play out in particular environments is a common question for us here at Georgia Tech. Um, another area that hopefully many of you have heard that we work in is the notion of the future of the home. Um, and what happens when the home becomes a place where technologies can potentially have a disruptive, potentially have an extremely beneficial role and again, you heard Ralph de la Vega showing some of the things that can be done uh, in the near, near term in the home environment. And we're continuing to ask the questions of what can be done in the next 20 years. The home is a great space to work in because it, 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 you can't just say, well, you know, the boss says we have to use fill-in products, so therefore we have to figure out a way to work around it. Um, in my home, I guess the boss would be my husband who says, this is a really cool thing and we better buy it uh, and install it and play around with it. But it's still the question, I know he's like, what, me? Um, it's still the question of what, how does technology work within the things that you care about as a family, uh, the things that make a difference in your day-to-day -day activities. And one of the areas that we've started working in over the past few years is the role of robotics within the home. And in particular, the role of robotics in uh, the care of older adults. And one of the, what happens when you start working and you start asking the question about the experience of technology as opposed to just can the technology do something is you get some tremendous surprises. Um, and one of the surprises that we've seen is the preference by older adults to robots as caregivers within the home environment. Now, we all agree this isn't going to happen tomorrow, right? We have many technical barriers uh, that need to be solved to produce robotics in a uh, cost-effective way for the home environment. But what we are hearing from the people that we are working with today is robots are more trusted. Because to be fair, the robot doesn't gossip with the neighbors. The robot's not going to rifle through your stuff. And you're not going to worry if the robot is stealing your favorite piece of jewelry. Now, these may seem like odd things to say, but the question is, you know, what would a person prefer if they are primarily homebound, um, if they are spending the majority of their time in their home, how could they have something that's anthropomorphic, that is trusted, that provides security, that provides connectivity, and provides a way for them to feel more powerful and independent than they would in other types of settings? So it's not an obvious, yes, robots are the way to go. It is not an obvious, no, rob robots have no place uh, in these kinds of settings. But it's much deeper questions about what certain types of tasks, what types of interactions will make this type of convergence work in the future. Um, and in the meantime, we're still working on that very basic interaction of a robot handing something to you and you taking it from its hand. Um, you, you would think that would sound simple, but we want to make sure that that happens both in a way that is safe and a way that is graceful 
and a way that is approachable. So again, these questions of experience and how do you design a place and a set of surroundings around these individuals. Um, not surprisingly, our work in the, uh, the future of the home environment led us to many questions of the, about the future of healthcare. Um, and I'll close in, uh, this talk in a few moments about some of the other projects that we're working in. But again, coming back to Steelcase, um, and now with the nurture team of, of asking, what do the future of healthcare places look like? Um, and paying attention to the work they're doing that both look at what uh, a hospital, in this case, a hospital environment would look like, but the real question is, what does it look like when it's being used? What does it look like when people are actually interacting and working within these spaces? And uh, we are privileged to continue to work with Steelcase in these questions where it's not just the future of these environments, but it's the future of all environments where health takes place. Um, that's in the home, uh, that is in uh, civic organizations, that is in the many places where people take care of each other because that's where health and wellness takes place takes place on, a, on an everyday basis. I want to close by pointing to a couple of examples where we're pushing the edges in this area. Uh, one is a project called Simtegrate, which is uh, coming out of the College of Architecture. This is Craig Zimmering's work with a number of colleagues. And the best way to think of this project is kind of CAD with steroids, or just CADs to the max, because the question is not just how you design a future healthcare environment, um, as you can see as it's pictured here, but how do you infuse that in design environment with the data available to you about how healthcare takes place? Because to be honest, most design tools will let you see something that structurally makes sense. It will let you see something that is beautiful. It will let you see something that is architecturally sound. But is it safe from a healthcare practice? Is it safe from the perspective of hospital-acquired infections? Is it safe from the question of medical error? Is it supportive of the actual care processes of how people coordinate and interact with each other? Does it take into consideration how devices need to be distributed through that environment um, and the audibility and visibility of those devices? Unfortunately, the tools we have today cannot answer these kinds of questions. And so that is what we're trying to accomplish with Simtegrate, which is that if you, could, if you have available to you the data uh, that you can practice evidence-based medicine by creating evidence-based design, you can create future healthcare places that are not only uh, acceptable for the healthcare processes, but they actually are supportive and work in conjunction with healthcare goals and healthcare needs. Uh, so we're uh, very excited about designing this kind of environment and working with a number of partners to move us forward in this area. And then finally, I want to focus on one of the startup companies that we've been working with. This is Solo Health. Um, and this is a kiosk that would sit in a, in a typical pharmacy uh, environment. And uh, it uh, pr provides a portal, it provides a way for an individual coming into a pharmacy to begin to uh, check information, uh, to uh, perhaps convey a set of symptoms or a set of concerns, and if necessary, appropriate, get the right referral uh, to other parts of their environment. One of the things, again, when you design for experiences and you design for technologies is that prepare yourself to be surprised. Some of their initial testing where they've got these out in you know, real live environments with people working with them is the social processes of how people come into their neighborhood pharmacy. All right, so I'm a city girl. Um, to be honest, you know, the, my pharmacist got to know me pretty well when my children were young and we were in there about every few months for an ear infection. All right, uh, picking up the antibiotics and it's like, yes, I'm back again, that kind of thing. They haven't seen me for a while. I'm very happy that my children are, are, are robust and healthy right now. Um, however, in pharmacies across this nation, and especially for older adults, this is, this is a local environment. This is where folks come together to be seen, to connect, talk, talk to in other individuals. It's part of their routine. And so now this portal, this place of health, is available to them, and it's not just something that's a convenience factor, but it's actually something where they connect to uh, people who care about them in a context that is meaningful to them. So I think we tend to maybe overemphasize the convenience factors of these kinds of technologies, and maybe that's what gets some of these ideas in the door, but it's when people start to integrate these technologies, these experiences into their daily life, into the ways that they interact with people in their community, 
including their local pharmacist, that it becomes part of their everyday pattern of healthcare. And it's designing for these kind of experiences that will enable us to move forward. So uh, as we go, uh, continue these investigations, uh, it is a continual goal of the Institute for People Technology is to understand experience design and more importantly, to create these kinds of laboratories, we refer to them as living laboratories, to create these laboratories where we can design for the collective human experience, we can understand that experience, and we can have, those, uh, have that knowledge, have those insights continue to feed into the questions of what technology needs to accomplish and the technical goals that we put before us. So it really becomes this beautiful virtuous cycle. Um, and I want to move from this discussion into what does it mean actually to support innovation within convergence? Um, and the, the first thing that I want to put out for you there is that when convergence is actually taking place, innovation is part and parcel of that. Um, a lot of our rhetoric in the discussions that we have about how do you catalyze innovation, how do you make it happen, right? If we just line up the right pieces, then um, you know, how, how do we make teams innovative? How do we allow people to think uh, uh, more creatively? Creativity. Um, when you have an environment where these threads, where these experiences, where these technologies are coming together, innovation actually just happens. It's like the petri dish. When you put the right things there, then innovation becomes part and parcel of that experience. And the secret to that, one very key secret, is that you allow innovation to happen by the people that are the owners and users of the system. When you assume that innovation only happens by the outsiders, only happens by the experts, you will only get 10% of the way. But when you create environments where the people using, owning, buying, consuming, participating in the system, when they can become the innovators, then amazing things happen. Um, uh, Ralph talked yesterday about you know, every employee being able to, to, to uh, you know, uh, submit an idea of something that could happen and then the best ideas would rise to the top. Those ideas were innovative because they were coming out of their daily experiences. They were coming out of what folks were trying to accomplish in their workplace environment, in their home environment, and saying, well, we work at AT&T. There should be some way that we can ha make these ideas happen. So I want to talk to you about some projects that show what it means to support this kind of innovation. Uh, the first is a project by... Uh, Mike Best and Company, and Mike works in our Sam Nunn School of International Affairs, uh, also has an uh, undergraduate degree in computer science from MIT, so he's uh, pretty, you know, he's kind of got convergence already going on uh, in his brain in terms of the things that he thinks about and the things he gets to work on. And he was working in the realm of social media, and in particular the realm of social media as, a, as applied to uh, supporting fair, uh, fair elections. And uh, this particular uh, work, they were in uh, uh, working the election in Nigeria. It's about a year or so back. And they were uh, monitoring the Twitter feeds. And it was really just a social media approach to understanding how people were using Twitter to convey what was happening at the polls, to convey what was happening in the election. Um, you know, how many people were showing up? You know, what was the feeling? Uh, what was the sentiment? Were we getting a large crowd? Were people participating? Um, and, uh, you know, taking advantage of social media affordances to do this. What happened in real time, though, was that violence began to break out in some uh, parts of the country. And they started to see it in the Twitter feeds. And what they did in terms of real-time innovation, because they had the code right there. So here's this team based in Atlanta. They're working throughout the night, working uh, nonstop on this. They recoded the system in real time to uh, detect tweets that were associated with violence uh, associated with any kind of mob, associated with any kind of activity that might be perceived as a threat, so that those tweets would rise to the top. So real-time, an you know, analytics in real time, and then they were able to use that information, convey that information back to uh, local responders. And in one case, there were uh, two uh, two women that were election volunteers that had, were seemed to be trapped in a hotel, and a mob was gathering outside the hotel, and they were quite worried about what's happening. So they were tweeting out saying what was happening to them. And uh, they were able to, uh, to rally local uh, law enforcement to go in and disperse the mob and get these two women um, out of, uh, of harm's way. So real-time innovation, this was a system designed for one thing, but in the hands of people who could then work with it were able to respond to the needs of the community. Now, in this case, we had famous researchers there, you know, code at hand, uh, ready to respond to a situation. 
What does it mean when we want to take a system and actually then provide a platform for expression? Um, hopefully many of you saw the, um, uh, saw the system called Hollaback last night. Uh, Jill Diamond, this was her PhD work. And this was a system uh, that is focused on the challenges of street harassment. Uh, street harassment uh, typically uh, of women, uh, but not, not solely of women. And what they have done is create a mobile and web platform which allows individuals to have a voice. And so at, at the basic core, what it means is if you've got, had an unpleasant experience you know, on the street or on the subway or in some sort of civic or public place, you can grab that information. You can grab your location, maybe you snap a picture, uh, you put a bit of information out there and it gets up to a website. Right? But what happens when you enable one voice is that you start to enable many voices. And what we were able to see with Hollaback was not only the question of giving voice to someone who was, um, whose rights were being infringed upon, but you were able to see how communities were able to take this information and start to have civic action around street harassment. And what happened in New York was different than what happened in Texas, was what was different than what happened in different parts of the world. So it became a platform for empowering voices. It became a platform for innovation just by providing the simple tools of connectivity, the simple tools of data that would allow voice and allow, and allow uh, this kind of convergence. This is what I mean by this form of innovation. So what you're going to hear about today as we also talk about what it means to create an innovation ecosystem at Georgia Tech is this question of how do you create an environment where our own students are able to work across their environment? What does it mean to create an innovation ecosystem within uh, Georgia Tech? And you're going to hear about a project called GT Journey. And what we're providing them are tools that allow them to augment, to change Georgia Tech in ways that matter to them. Um, you're going to hear some of them, uh, work about uh, some of the work they're doing in augmenting places where they're able to take tools such as our augment, Argon Augmented Reality Browser and be able to augment their spaces and they're able to start to tell the story of what Georgia Tech looks like to them. And it was fascinating. I was talking to uh, one of the students last week when they were, sh were, they were showing their work. And um, this is a sophomore, extremely bright, bright kid, uh, very excited. He was showing me all the things that the system could do. And uh, I knew a lot about the system, but he didn't know that, so he was telling me everything. It was fantastic. And he, um, he was saying, you know, what it means is this campus group could, you know, uh, augment the campus in this way, and they can put this information out there, and if this group is having this kind of event, they can do this, and if this group is doing this, and he's just rattling off the opportunities, because all of these groups, all these voices on campus could take these tools and then start adding to the campus in their way with their voice. And this is completely different than the top-down approach that says, we're going to have the campus tour of campus, and this is what everyone should see, and this is the, the bona fide, you know, uh, authorized Georgia Tech experience but it allowed the students to be able to bring their own voices into that. And he was so funny because he's like, you know, even a freshman could do this. That easy. Right? But this is what we mean by this notion of creating innovation within the ecosystem itself. You make it so easy that even a freshman could do this. So easy that, you know, any woman with a, with a phone can grab the information and talk back to her community and connect with others and start to empower those own voices. That's what innovation and convergence mean coupled together. It's not something that you make happen with a bunch of pizza boxes and say, go do something great. It's what happens when you provide the tools and capabilities out to a community and you make it easy enough, even for a freshman, to change their world in a way that matters to them. So as we continue working with you and continue working through these challenges, we want to understand what it means to provide these tools, to provide these technologies, to create this kind of convergence, to create this kind of innovation ecosystem. All right, I'm getting two completely different set of timing cues. Um, so I'm going to take the one that gives me more time. Because um, I want to talk to you just for one few more minutes um, about transformation. And this is where enterprises come into play. Um, because I, so, so far the story I've told you is, you know, we invent technology and technology is disruptive and we, we understand the experience and we design for that experience. And then we are able to then create a world where people can innovate within those spaces and they can bring their own voices and their own needs to the forefront. So that's a pretty rosy story. Um, but sometimes 
the world needs a bit of a push to change the big ship that's going in this direction and move it in a different direction. We need to be able to move the needle. Okay, I got it. Um, and this is where we talk about the world of transformation. Um, and so Raul Basoli is here, Ron Johnson's here. These are folks that are associated with our Tenenbaum Institute for Enterprise Transformation. And these are a set of individuals that understand that when you want to move something that is significant, a major enterprise, you need the tools and the processes and the capabilities to enable that kind of significant change to happen. And as Steve mentioned earlier, and I promise I'm flying through it, uh, one of the areas that we're trying to do this was, is in the realm of healthcare and healthcare systems, and in particular Medicaid. So I'm going to breeze through this, but what does it mean to transform a healthcare system? Well, first you need to understand how it happens and what's working and what's not working. You have to understand the availability, for example, of pediatric healthcare providers in the state, where they are and where they're not, and where access isn't just geographic access, but it's also access in terms of public transportation, it's access in terms of health literacy, it's access in terms of support community to schools. Access and the ability to work within a pediatric health system is a complicated question, so we need to understand that because we know it's not working, so how do we transform it? It requires creating the tools for new forms of liquidity of information within the space, uh, new forms of connectivity. Um, and our work within health information exchange and supporting building multiple layers of health information exchange in the state of Georgia and beyond is critically important to transforming that system. It requires uh, physicians being able to work with new forms of electronic health care records and being able to collaborate, connect, remember those things that we talked about? Um, to collaborate and connect in new ways to transform their work practices to be able to meet the demands of our current system. It requires patients to become engaged, patients to become empowered. This is our work in, um, in Rome, Georgia, in terms of uh, access to personal health records by breast cancer uh, patients and survivors. How do they have their own voice within their care uh, to make that care more effective and have higher quality outcomes? Um, and it requires the ability to build tools for enterprises for systems that say we want to move where our system is transaction oriented and it's expensive and the outcomes aren't great to be able to move to a system that is outcome oriented that is more cost effective and we have higher uh, health quality outcomes. Those kinds of questions require significant tools, simulator, uh, simulations, the tools that allow people to see how to get from point A to point B when that distance is large. Um, and so this work allows us to be able to pull together the information to say, okay, well, you know point B is where you want to get to go, but you better be able to afford to get there. So how do we create simulations that allow us to understand how we want to change healthcare and how we can pay for it in the end? Now I'm starting to sound like a politician. And finally, we need to provide new tools and new capabilities for how people interact with their system, uh, whether it's the capabilities of rural health uh, through mobile health systems, whether it's the capabilities of pediatric uh, asthma management, all the new types of technologies, all those things that we talked about in the, in the media outlook, allowing them to be transformative to bringing us to a new healthcare system. So these are the, this is a new form of convergence where we purposely assemble the pieces because we know to transform the system, it is going to take a tremendous amount of healthy, heavy lifting. And Georgia Tech, through our work with our partners, is capable of doing that level of heavy lifting to be able to get us to some place where we, need, we know we need to get to. So in conclusion, uh, my, time, my timekeepers have given up on me. In conclusion, this is the ecosystem. These are the kinds of questions that we're working on. Uh, we invite you to work with us uh, to find new ways to engage Georgia Tech and your partnerships through the Institute of People and Technology. We work on the convergence of people and technology enterprises in health, education, media, and humanitarian systems. We bring together a tremendous multidisciplinary set of expertise to these questions. Uh, we work with a fantastic set of partners, always looking to add and increase this list in the ways that we can work with you together. Um, and we're thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with you today uh, and to talk with you in the future. Thank you very much.